Hi, everyone. I'm your host, Michael Matthew, and my podcast is Michael Matthew of Vibrant Health. Welcome, welcome. And once again, for the video number four, I am really thrilled to have my friend and mentor, uh, Sally Kane Norton, joining us today. Uh, the topic today in regards to oxalates is Let's take a look at the foods that are high in oxalates and low in oxalates. Welcome, Sally. Thank you, Michael. It's always fun to be with you. So my boring engineer brain, of course, in thinking about this video was like, hey, Sally, let's just dive into the list in your table in your book. Um, and actually, I'm realizing as I say that, for those of you who don't know Sally, um, Sally has her her BS in nutrition from Cornell University. She has her master's in public health from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, she did her best to eat really, really well with the idea of avoiding disease and ate what the diet dictocrats were telling us was the most healthy foods you could eat. And in the process, she totally trashed her health. And now over the last 10 years, she's been recovering it by going on a low oxalate diet. And we're going to get into that. We're going to get into the foods that are high and low. And, and I'll just throw in, I did basically the same thing. And uh, my journeys, I'm still in the middle of it. So anyway, um, okay. So, and then I, I want to throw out too, right behind Sally is the cover of her book, Toxic Superfoods. And uh, we're going to be talking about, yep, there it is. And we're going to be talking about table 14.1, which is a list of the foods that are high in oxalates and low. But before we actually start diving into the table itself and, and those food lists, um, we want to uh, mention one of the big things with, with oxalates, because some people are going to really lose it when they start hearing some of those foods that we all love. Um, it's, it's a lot about the dose. It, that's one really important thing to, to, to pay attention to. So you're going to hear chocolate is really high in oxalate, but how much chocolate do you eat? What form is it in? Are you eating like one big bar every day of dark chocolate that's super high in cocoa? Or are you eating a few chocolate chips? Totally different scenario. So anyway, do you want to say anything about that, Sally, before we get going into the list? Yeah, absolutely. So it, people's mindset is hung up around sort of gluten and you can't have any because if you have celiac disease, you can't have any, you can't even breathe it in the air. You need separate cutting boards in the house. Like you have to be very kosher, you might say, about gluten and, and, and with allergens, you have to be really careful with peanut allergies and so on. And that's been the mindset now for the last 15, 20 years around food, um, having to be curating very carefully what you expose yourself to, this is not that. Oxalate is a toxicity, not an allergy. And people use the term sensitivity, which I think confuses the two. Yep, We're, I heard that recently, so yeah. It's yeah, I don't like the term sensitivity because it makes it sound like it's an allergy and that's not the case. Although you can teach your immune system to act like it's allergic to the high oxalate foods and you can get immune reactions because of the effects of the oxalate that look just like allergies, look just like infections. So it's, not, it's very confusing in a way, but remember that this is more like avoiding mercury and lead and other poisons than it is uh, worrying about an allergy. And that means that smaller the dose, the less you eat, the safer it is. But it, it also means that you can have, if you eat one bite of spinach, or you know, a couple of chocolate chips, as you just said, that might be okay. It might be just fine, depending yeah. on the person and the situation. And it's worth mentioning, and it'll be a topic for another time. Our body actually makes some of its own oxalate. We call that endogenous oxalates. So the body's somewhat prepared, but the problems come is that the way our diets have been shifting over the last hundred years or so we're focusing on foods that are higher and higher more than we ever did. And now it's really showing up as serious problems for a lot of folks. Although we've known about it for what, 200 years, Sally? 200 years, yeah. Yeah. We've known that oxalates in foods are bad for us and can cause health problems. 
but we've forgotten it in the last 50 to 100 years. We've really dropped it, I would say, in the last 80 years. And now there's an aversion to talking about oxalates as if it's like only for somebody who's dying of kidney failure or had multiple kidney stones, we'll get around to checking, oh yeah, maybe you shouldn't eat spinach after we've ruined your health. We're going to ignore this until you're really sick. Otherwise, people don't want to talk about oxalates, but we're we're learning that that was a big mistake to be ma made cavalier and think oxalate is just a little calcium chelator or whatever. You know, it, we've the, the casual attitude in our science and nutrition and in medical world is not fitting. Yeah. Yep. So one more preface before we, we dive into the list. Um, the, I want to keep the list more towards the front of this video and, um, but stay tuned till the end because Sally is going to present some really important caveats on where this data comes from and how you got to take all of this with a bit of a grain of salt or a grain of oxalate. Uh, <laughs> anyway, anyway, so the way we're going to do it is we're going to go through uh, in Sally's book, Table 14.1, and, uh, and we'll try to keep this not too boring, but want to just get the foods 197. out there. We're on page 197. There you this go. This is actually also earlier on. There's lots of tables in here and you'll encounter a high oxalate list early on in the book too. Table 3.1 has the worst offenders and there's a safe bets table somewhere nearby too. So, but this is all together, the worst offenders and safe bets in the converting your diet chapter, chapter 14. So we're going to go through, um, I'm going to play bad cop and Sally's going to play good cop. So I'll introduce the foods that are the worst offenders. And we're going to go through in categories. So we're going to start with animal products. And uh, on a good note, there aren't any animal products that are particularly high in oxalates. Except the giant toxic snail. <laughs> which, which is, is available in... off some island in the Pacific, I think. <laughs> and that's the only one you've heard of that's the one that'll get you the giant toxic snail so look out for giant toxic snails near you which there won't be any you'll be okay <laughs> and, and we, the, go ahead i was just gonna say some of the animal foods have a little but it's like incredibly small yeah in just general. something to ignore generally just think of all animal products as perfectly safe to eat which includes butter eggs fish you name it yeah Okay, so next category, beverages. I'm gonna just be boring and just read off the list so I don't skip any, but um, we've got all those different almond beverages like almond milk, beet juice, carrot juice, chocolate favorite flavored beverages, which could be chocolate milk, hot chocolate, mocha coffees, chocolate plant drinks, yada, yada, yada. And then we go into the teas, both black and green. And what about white? I don't see that on your list, but does that? The white tea is, a, to remember, it's only been tested a couple of times and it's, it's a kind of black and green tea. It's very similar. So it definitely has some oxalate in it. Yep. Yep. And then we've got V8 vegetable juice and, uh, and then starfruit juice, which according to the times I've heard you speak, Sally, there's some reports of people dying from eating starfruit juice. Yes. Yep. And those reports are coming out of medical literature in Brazil and in Asia, where this starfruit is a super elixir like spinach juice. <laughs> it's a, like carrot juice. If you're sick, eat starfruit juice in Asia. And unfortunately, it's really uber toxic for oxalates. Why, that's why it made my cover of the book. Um, and people literally drop dead, especially if they have renal failure. So if the kidneys can't get rid of it, you're you're probably going to have a stroke or heart attack with your star fruit juice, health food elixir. And I I've been see I've seen something in the last year where there was some company who's putting out pomegranate juice, and I was curious if you know if that's high because. It's probably, I'm guessing it might be the seeds that are the highest, but. It's it's definitely high. If I in, never trust my brain for remembering numbers or data, but I think we're talking 10 milligrams per cup or something. It's not okay. the worst, but it's definitely, 
The problem with juicing generally is that the oxalate is now in this water solution that makes it more easily absorbed into the bloodstream. So something juiced, you've kind of removed the fibers and then the need to chew and, and you've added more. The more dilute it is, the more toxic it is because it has an easier time of getting into the blood when it's dilute, which is counterintuitive. And I'm just going to throw in real quick. Uh, have you seen any data on the fermented beet drink, beet kvass? I don't think anyone with real science chops have measured it, but okay. it's, um, I've based on beet, you know, you can estimate that it definitely you need, if you're going to eat kvass, make it like a tablespoon or three tablespoons a day, not like a whole cup of it. Got it. Okay, good cop. Do the beverage thing. You can have apple cider, beer, coffee, all coffee, even instant coffee, if made according to the normal strength, you know, a teaspoon of dry powder per cup. Coconut milk, fruit juices like apple, cherry, cranberry, lemon, lime, and orange juice. Ginger ale, herbal teas, almost all the herbal teas. Ginger tea has some oxalate in it. So, you know, don't overdo the ginger tea, but Otherwise, most of the herbal teas, even when made from herbs that are high in oxalate, seem to be pretty low in oxalate, which is sort of surprising. I don't have a good answer as to why. Dairy milk, kefir, sparkling water, of course, and wine. All low oxalate beverages. So you're seeing here in, what, in the way that Sally and I are talking about this, one of the ways to approach the whole oxalate thing is get yourself familiar, start being aware of the foods that are high, because sometimes, you know, when people hear the list and what's high, they freak out and think, how am I going to eat? But the way we're trying to present this is, hey, let you can do substitutions for things that are in a similar ballpark. And we'll, that'll show more of as we get it's deeper. Functional ballpark. Like it can fill in because it's a beverage. It can fill in because it's a vegetable. It can fill in because it's a, you know, nutritive um, food like animal foods. Yep. Okay. So next, next category, we have the desserts and oops, my phone's being goofy. Give me a second. Um, so we have the desserts, snacks, and treats section and bad guys that we need to be careful with are carob products. And carob is a, as actually a bean or a legume in case people haven't heard of it. And a lot of people over the years, my myself, when, you know, I was trying to stay away from chocolate for various reasons, went over to carob. And turns out carob is quite high in oxalate also. So chips it made might be with, good news since carob doesn't taste very good. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't taste as good, no. Chips made with banana, plantain, potato, sweet potato, or taro, which is, you'll see in the, what is it, the Terra chips that use taro root in their chips, I believe. Lot, yeah, the, it's surprising how much the taro and plantain and even beets are showing up in chips, chip type products. Yeah, and it should cassava be in there? I, that's one I'm not sure about. Yeah, yeah, okay. cassava yeah. and taro, I believe are the same plant. Oh, okay. Um, and then crackers containing nuts, sesame, poppy, or chia seeds, chocolate or cocoa products, which brownies, cake, ice cream, etc. And then rhubarb and anything made with rhubarb. Yeah. I loved rhubarb crisp as a kid. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I think I did too. <laughs> or raw, rhubarb strawberry. That was one of the ones. I think that's the way it often got made in my house. Yeah, my mother didn't bother with the strawberries because she didn't have them in the backyard. Well, we had that rhubarb patch behind the garage. I ate a lot of it. Okay, so instead, you can have crackers, kind of standard, like boring saltine crackers, not nutritionally a great idea, but you can have also crackers made with flax. Um, so flax crackers, pickles, pork rinds, toasted coconut flakes blueberry jam, candied ginger. When they candy the ginger, you boil it for an hour and it extracts a lot, if not all of the oxalate, the soluble oxalate. So it's, the, the crystallized ginger is really low and that's a favorite treat in my house. 
Dates are really low. Don't believe the internet, guys. The WebMD will stir you wrong. I have a blog post about dates or a couple of them. And ice cream, vanilla or coconut flavors, chocolate ice cream, not so great. But the vanilla and the simple ones, delicious. Whipped cream and white chocolate. All treats, snacks, options. Okay, next category. We're into fruits and berries. And it's probably worth mentioning the kind of quantity we're talking about or serving size is in about a half cup of the uh, whole fruits and a cup of juice. So we have in the high category, apricots, avocados that are not fully ripened. Important distinction, blackberries, clementines, elderberries, figs, guava, kiwi, lemon zest, which is the, the peel, uh, when people grate off the peel for flavoring, olives, pears, anju pears are okay. Others can have more problems. Plantains, pomegranates, prunes, raspberries, rhubarb, star fruit, and tangelos. Yeah, so back to the zest, the, the citrus peels are high in oxalates. So if you use citron to make candied fruit cakes, like fruit cake at uh, holiday time, um, that can be really high in oxalate. We used to have this citron stolen at Christmas that my grandfather, the chef, made. I loved that stuff. I had this magnetism to oxalate foods. So yeah, the Anjou pear is one that tested high. Um, so there's not a lot of pear tests. There's a possibility that a half of a pear of a different type is probably fine. We need more testing. But the safe bet fruits are apples, blueberries in that half cup serving with the cultivated being slightly lower in oxalate than the wild, as far as we know. Cherries, coconut, cranberries, especially the fresh ones. Something about the dried ones. I think there was a test that was... Hmm, not so sure. But once again, dates are low. Seedless grapes are low. The ripe Haas avocado is pretty low in this serving size, half cup serving size. Melon, that's cantaloupe, honeydew, watermelon, and their friends, probably the Crenshaw, I think is another example. Kumquat, which is a little citrus fruit that you, where you do eat the whole peel and apparently even peel and all, it's okay which is cool, but that's some um, the mysteries of vet plants, right? <laughs> Peaches, fruit juices, including apple, orange, lemon, lime, and pineapple. And then uh, bananas, generally low if you keep the portion reasonable. Mango seems to be very low. Papaya and fresh plums are probably okay. But again, I think with the plums, you wanna keep the portions reasonable. You don't see pineapple fruit on here, but I think a reasonable portion of pineapple is sort of okay-ish, maybe not more, but a half cup isn't very much. So keep that in mind. Next category. Grains and grain substitutes, grain products. And serving size wise, we're talking dry, one quarter cup cooked, one half cup. And the players are amaranth, uh, one of the ancient grains, arrowroot, barley flour, buckwheat flour, green banana flour, potato flour, um, not to be confused with just potato, rice bran, starch. Yes. Uh, and uh, rice bran, tapioca flour, teff the Ethiopian grain, wheat germ, corn grits, quinoa, another alternative grain, shredded wheat cereal, pumpernickel breads, rye breads, and whole grain breads. So Sally, before you uh, do the good ones, I don't see wheat, like if you just like cooked up wheat by itself. 
where does where does that fall in? Just a so grain. like cream of wheat and the refined wheat it is not too bad. And chapter somewhere in here, I talk about wheats and breads and in how they can start adding up. But if you're just doing a small portion, like is listed here, you could probably get away with that even a couple times a day. It's a little equivocal because plants vary a lot and flour and grain products vary a lot. And and as I mentioned early on in the book. In addition to all the other factors that cause plants to vary, you have the po possibility, the likelihood of mold contamination with grains. And black mold produces oxalate and can add to the oxalate load. So there's really, we often don't know enough about this grain product that we're consuming to know for sure, because we don't know how much of these various factors are playing in. But generally a small amount of refined grains, the white flour, the white rice is pretty low um, are because it's the bran and the germ where most of the oxalates hanging out in these grains. You'll notice too, just to underscore this, that arrowroot, buckwheat, potato flour, rice bran, tapioca, teff, quinoa, th this is the kind of stuff people start eating when they're told to go on a gluten-free diet. That's me. And you're going on a gluten-free diet because your gut's messed up. And now you're going on a higher oxalate diet, which will continue to mess with your gut. And make you feel worse. And cause systemic degeneration of your bones and your brain and your connective tissues and your organs. So it's not a good trade-off. Really, it's not. But that's really sad. That's why we're doing this work. Because if you're sick enough to go on a gluten-free diet, you're too sick to eat a high oxalate diet period. And so this is a big mistake we're making as a way of helping people heal on a gluten-free diet. So I just had to put out that little commercial. Thank you. So if you are on a gluten-free diet or not, you get to have coconut flour, corn starch, potato starch, which has like no oxalate, but potato flour is high, but the starch is just the carbs and not the other junk. So it's so refined that it removes the oxalate. Uh, rice starch, Cooked white rice, Uncle Ben's minute rice, cellophane noodles made from mung beans, kelp noodles, shirataki noodles, which is from this seaweed, not, no, from like a, it's like a kudzu type plant, I think. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> white rice spaghetti, corn on the cob, coconut wraps, kelp noodles, pearl barley. Now, I'm not saying these create a healthy diet. I'm saying these are functional things you can use in the, in the category of, I want a starchy grain like pasta like thing. These can stand in for you and you can use them to make baked goods and so on. It doesn't necessarily that, that you're building a really nutritional diet with these foods, but they're low in oxalate and they're very useful, <laughs> very. Okay, then we're moving into greens and other vegetables in the one half cup serving size. The players to be careful of are uh, artichoke hearts, beets, which some people call beet root, but then we have beet green as well. Carrots, celery, chard, Swiss chard, uh, cactus, nopal, okra, parsnips, sugar snap peas, potatoes, both in the white and sweet categories. Uh, and then also their derivatives of fries, chips, and other forms. Spinach, that superfood spinach, and tomato sauce and yams. Yes. And so the big, these, the really big ones on there are the beet greens, the chard, and the spinach. Those guys are off the charts trouble. Really got to be careful with those or just like, please don't eat them. That's my plea. <laughs> Instead, you can have alfalfa sprouts, arugula, bok choy, chives, red bell pepper, cabbage, capers, cauliflower, celery root or celerac, cilantro, cucumber, escarole, kale, pretty much best, best if boiled, the kales, the various kales, kimchi, kohlrabi, lettuce, which includes romaine, bib, butter, and iceberg, and pretty much any other lettuce, 
the leaf lettuces are fine. Minza, is that the right way to say that, Michael? I don't know that one. It's this frilly, um, spiky, light green, lettuce-like green. And mushrooms are low. Most of the culinary mushrooms are low, except some of the medicinal mushrooms are not necessarily low. But again, they haven't been tested enough for us to have a really sharp answer about that. But um, chaga, I would stay away from. But the regular culinary mushrooms are fine. Mustard greens are really low. Onions, radishes, rutabaga, turnips, winter squash, like butternut, you name it. Uh, acorn squash, kaboka squash, there's lots of those. They're all trustworthy. Watercress, water chestnuts, zucchini. Uh, asparagus, broccoli, especially if you boil your broccoli. That's the one that really seems to benefit from boiling is broccoli. Brussels sprouts boiled is a good idea for them too. And you can boil them and then you can roast them in the oven. You can still do other techniques and boil them. Collards, endive, green peas boiled, green bell pepper, raw kale and pumpkin, all reasonably low in oxalate. Proven. Is it worth mentioning that um, that curly kale, which is one of the types that a lot of people eat, is it's not super high, but it's kind of more in the medium category? Yeah, it's definitely got more oxalate than the lactonado and the purple kale. The curly green kale is testing as the highest kale. So it's not the best choice in the kale department. But if, if you're if you've been eating spinach and Swiss chard, it's a way better choice even that one. All right, then we're moving into seasonings and herbs uh, that are high. Black pepper, caraway and poppy seeds, cinnamon, cumin, Indian style curry powder, parsley and turmeric. Yes. So instead, use plenty of salt, good salt, mineral salt, white pepper. There's a really nice Indonesian white pepper that Penzi sells that I would highly recommend. It's great. Frank's uh, red hot sauce, Tabasco sauce. It's because the, the cayenne and the hot peppers are not too bad. And, and that's a lot of vinegar and stuff too, to water them down and expand their flavor. So you get a lot of mileage flavor-wise out of those sauces without a lot of oxalate. Horseradish, Garlic, fresh or dried, is low in oxalate, despite whatever you see on the internet. Honey, stevia, and sugar. Stevia has nothing really oxalate-wise. And even if you were eating 100 grams of stevia, it would be equivalent to a plate of broccoli, boiled broccoli. It wouldn't be a big deal. So there's another, that's another big myth on the internet that stevia is loaded with oxalate. Well, even if it was, you're, you're using two drops. <laughs> It's about the dose. Now, two drops has pretty much zero oxalate in it. Um, but if you ate a whole cup of it, you'd probably throw up because the stuff's so toxic. You wouldn't ever, so please, that's my little rant on stevia. Sugar is got a little oxalate in it. Surprisingly, sugar has a little oxalate in it, but it's still not much, especially if you're eating a reasonable diet and not living on sugar. Dried herbs are the, the bay leaf, dill, marjoram, onion powder, poultry seasoning, rosemary, sage, savory, tarragon, and thyme. I want to put a plug in there for rosemary. I think you should use it. It's very versatile herb. It goes with everything. And dill, lamb. Mm, lamb, but it goes with, I make my little meat cookies. They really, with enough white pepper and salt, they turn ground pork into a sausage-like thing. Um, delicious. And the Dill, fresh dill is to die for and really great on fish, and but lots of things. Spices, cayenne, mace, mustard seeds, and then extracts are very low. You can get a chocolate extract, lemon extract, peppermint extract, vanilla, and so on. Those are all very low. Ground cardamom, Italian seasoning, and um, dried oregano used in reasonable amounts is fine. Oregano does have some oxalate in it, but it, it has, it goes a long way. Just don't throw in tablespoons of it and you're great. 
and turmeric extract is low as well, isn't it? Yeah, curcumin's the curcumin extracts are practically zero, but the whole root turmeric is wickedly high. And I believe as somebody who took milk thistle for a long time, the extract is low, but the seeds are really high. The seeds are really high. The extracts, I think, vary. You can't be completely oh, confident okay. with that one. Okay. Another one that doesn't extract out very well is olive leaf is kind of high from the medicinal herbs and, and it stays a little high with the extract. And so I think there's more testing to be done on all those things. Cool. Moving on, we got legumes and beans. Uh, in the high category, we have black beans, great northern, pinto, and most other legumes. Uh, soy flour, soy milk, soy protein. Uh, and be careful with vegetarian burgers and meat analogs. So in the legumes and beans department low, black eyed peas are very low. Butter beans, one of my former favorites, also really low. Um, it's important with these legumes, these bean and seed things, they, they are well soaked so that they're at the stage of about to sprout and then cooked in a pressure cooker. So the very high heat kills off the lectins. If you have gut and health problems, you need to be careful with these lectiny beans. Um, green peas, do boil them for that same reason, but they're a reasonable half cup of green peas is great. Looks great on the plate. Most people like them, but do boil them well and cook them. Don't eat raw peas. Mung beans are pretty low, only a, cup, a test or two. And the mung bean sprouts are similar. A half cup of mung bean sprouts, I think is equivalent to a cup of cooked mung beans in terms of oxalate content. And then the split peas, yellow and green split peas are great too. So when you talk about soaking these beans adequately enough, what kind of timing are we talking about? Three days. Yeah. Does anybody do that? No. Yeah. Including the one who canned your beans. And when you're buying canned beans, they're not only in a BPA or, you know, can, but they haven't been properly sprouted and they've been high cooked because they're in a can, but um, you could probably do better at home. It's interesting. The literature suggests three and a half to four days. I can't even break the news to you. That's why we say three days. <laughs> But that's what the medical literature shows. It takes a very long soak, which is three days pretty much assures a germination stage. So you're really switching the metabolism of the, the bean and therefore those lectin proteins are now physiologically different. And, if and they still need the high heat though, it's not enough to just sprout them. You should high heat them. So you don't, this raw business of eating a raw diet, people in raw diets are eating these, um, uncooked legumes. And that's not a great idea. I mean, that's even why mung beans, sprouts, and those things should be eaten only in small amounts of sort of crunchy garnishes on subs and sandwiches and tops of, they're not entrees. And the soaking also gets out the phytic acid, which can rob minerals inside our body as well. Yep. Yep. All right, last category, seeds and nuts. The high category is chia, hemp, poppy, and sesame. And in the nut category, almonds, cashews, pecans, pine nuts, and walnuts. I used to eat walnuts all the time. <laughs> they were my snack. What everyone else is doing with, with almonds, I did with walnuts. I found this great recipe book years ago that was because uh, I figured out I had trouble with dairy a long time ago and it was how to make nut cheese. So lots of cashews. Yeah. Way before it was fashionable. You were way oh, ahead yeah. of your time, yeah, dear. <laughs> Good thing for that. Good we can laugh because we'd be crying. All right. So instead, you can have coconut. All forms of coconut are nice and low. Flax are nice and low. Pumpkin, sunflower, watermelon. The oils from all these seeds, even if they're high oxalate, are low in oxalate because oxalate is going to be in the aqueous fraction. And when you make an oil, the oil portion floats above what's down in the water layer. 
and you basically separate out the oxalates with the oil. So oils and fats are always low to zero oxalate. So even if it comes from a peanut, we haven't emphasized peanuts, which are in the legume category. Peanuts have high in bioavailable oxalate, easily overdone, often served with chocolate and not a great idea. <laughs> And uh, so, but peanut oil, like if you're going out for Asian food, often they use peanut oil, say at a Vietnamese restaurant, you're cool with that. Don't worry about it. You can have that for the occasional treat out. I wouldn't recommend living on seed oils, but you don't, you can eat out now and then, now and then here and there, but home cooking is better. Okay. So that's the whole list. We've covered, we've covered nuts to animal foods and back and forth again. All righty. So um, again, I mentioned this at the beginning, but uh, to wrap things up, Sally would like to make some caveats or, or mention and talk some caveats about where this data comes from. And I'll hand it back to you, Sally. Yeah. So people really expect that there's one number and we know that number for all the foods that you want to try. And none of that is true. So in the, where you get this information about oxalates and food requires a scientist in a laboratory to analyze the food. And that person has to select the food. So what food did they select to test? Which kind of eggplant did they choose? Was it this variety, this variety? Has anyone ever looked at a seed catalog? Do you know that there's probably 50 varieties of eggplants now, all developed by human beings? And they're not telling us which eggplant they analyzed. They're also not telling us if they included the skin or not. They're not telling us a lot about it, when it was harvested, where they got it, how old it was, how it was prepared. So, all right, you might get an eggplant number, but it has nothing to do with the eggplant you bought. And who knows what it is? Like there's often, and then it may have only been one test. So how variable is, maybe it's the standard if there's such a thing, purple eggplant, the classic kind of eight inch long, four inch diameter, shiny dark purple eggplant. That vegetable, if it hasn't been tested over three years from three different places, we don't know how variable that is. So we don't know how solid that one test is in terms of representing the spectrum of the average eggplant. So. The problem with some of this data is they're not, it's not described well. It also doesn't even tell us if it's raw or cooked, peeled or not, seeds included or not. It, it's very poorly described and not repeated. So the food itself, we often don't know much about the food, even what one was tested, let alone how many times it's been tested. And then you got to hand it to the scientist. Now he's got his little he went to the grocery store. He picked out random foods. The grocery store didn't tell him much about the food they bought. They, he doesn't actually know which seed variety was used. So he's just saying eggplant because the store didn't tell him. You don't know which green bean. You know, there's like 50 kinds of green beans and strawberries. There's tons, you know, like, so there's a lot of potential variability that's completely ignored in the data and you have no way to know. Then he's got to pick his technique, he or she, which technique they're going to use to analyze it. And you're going to wonder, has this person done this a lot? Do they understand oxalate testing? Do they understand foods and food oxalate testing? Did they do a good job? Did they pick the right test? Read my blog on coffee to get a sense for the significance of that. And then you've got the data itself. Did they write down the right data? Did they collect the right numbers? And then when they put it in the chart, did they get it straight and not make any mistakes? And then when it got published, did the publisher not make any mistakes? And then when someone turned it into a list, did they not make any mistakes? I can tell you from handling Oxley data now for the last 10 years that it's easy to make a mistake in data and introduce new mistakes. Every time you handle data, you potentially introduce a mistake. So then you've got this list and then the end user has to make sense of the list of the data and the numbers and they have to be skillful, whether it's a dietitian or somebody who's just constructing their own diet or trying to get familiar with oxalates, they have to use this data correctly and often they don't or can't, and they misunderstand how to convert volume to amount of oxalate and so on. Like with the stevia business that I talked about already, pretend stevia is high, which it's not. But if it were high, you're still only using one drop of liquid or a little dusting of powder. You're using such a small amount, it ends up being insignificant. But the end user often doesn't understand that and can make mistakes. And then how to add up, 
individual foods into a whole menu, a single meal and a whole day menu. How does that all add up? And, and that handling of the data for the end user is there's easy to misinterpret it there. It's also easy to not understand, like the researcher themselves can freak out about 100 grams of instant coffee is high in oxalate. But 100 grams of instant coffee makes like 200 cups of coffee. Nobody eats that much. And so by the time you make a little cup of coffee with it, it's an insignificant amount of oxalate. But even a scientist will make this mistake and put in the title of their report published for the world to see that coffee is high in oxalate when it's not. So please be aware of everything you see online. The WebMD and all those other guys have lots of mistakes online. It's not correct. So this data, this, these lists are simplified um, data that we trust well enough to be able to say, this is trustworthy as a lowish oxalate food. Don't worry about it. And these foods are high in oxalate and you need to be paying attention to how much of them you're eating. Hopefully that's helpful. Awesome. Thank you, Sally. So good uh, to be with you. Yeah. Um, anything else? Well, besides telling people where to find you, is there anything else you want to say to wrap it up? With this well, chat? I am working on trustworthy Oxlade data and have been working on this for four years. I have a database and we'll, it's been a lot of work and I'm so distracted with everything else. It's not like I have a ton of time to work on it all the time, but um, you'll be able to get numbers. And people who are deep in the weeds with oxalate illness and trying to really get it right and finesse it, there really is a lot in this book. You can go to the, the dosing chart in the back of the book. Remember, not, I don't think everyone's always aware that there's a dosing chart in the back. And this is, this is listing common high oxalate foods that are not a lot of beans and stuff that I think are not healthy for you. If you're sick enough to be worrying about it at this level, you probably shouldn't be eating nuts and beans because of the lectins and the, the general gut irritating nature of them. They're not in this list, but all the other high oxalate foods are in this list and how much you can have to achieve a 20 milligram dose of oxalate or achieve a 30 milligram dose of oxalate, or you can add them together. This is where the end user needs to be careful, but I've tried to make this so straightforward. Like it takes um, fresh boiled artichoke hearts. You can have a half cup of artichoke hearts to get 30 milligrams. And you may need, if you're on a carnivore diet or on a super zero oxalate diet, you might need to add in some artichoke hearts. So some of these ingredients, these high oxalate ingredients, you can use them in small amounts in recipes because if you're adding 10 or 15 milligrams of oxalate to a recipe that serves four people, that's fine. You know, you don't have to do zero olives and zero this and that. And you can use this chart in the back to get a sense of dose and how much oxalate is in a certain amount of the food. So be aware of this dosing table. If you need to get more than that, you can get this bigger table from my website sometime in the not too distant future. Groovin. Groovin. All righty. Um, and then let people know where they can find you and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Yeah, please visit me at sallyknorton.com. That's my website. And there's lots of free information there. You can get on my email list. I'm trying to send out a weekly email. And so expect a, you know, about a weekly email. And when you're new to the list, you, you'll you get some um, initial like suggestions for how to get going on the low oxalate diet. And a, a lovely welcome because, man, you're smart to start paying attention to oxalates in your diet. You're a genius. So keep it up. <laughs> And then on Instagram? Yeah, I'm on Instagram at SK Norton and then toxic superfoods underscore oxalate underscore book. So I have two Instagram accounts. My original one was SK Norton. And then the second one is toxic superfoods underscore oxalate underscore book. Awesome. Well, once again, Sally, um, thank you so much for, for doing this diving in deeper stuff that we're doing here together. So I really appreciate your time and your experience. So thank you so much. And until next time, um, we'll be seeing you again down the road. So Excellent. That's wonderful. It's fun to be working through the book and through these topics with you. And I know your listeners are having a good time. So thank you for your work. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. See you next time. Okay, bye, bye everyone.